Hello and welcome back. I am Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports in Westfield, Indiana, and you are watching Marksman TV. Today I have a video I'm really excited about getting into for you guys. Today we're going to be looking at a couple 1918 A2 BARs, but one of these is not actually a 1918 A2, and you probably can't even tell just by looking at them. This is actually a 1918 A3 SLR produced by Ohio Ordnance Works in Ohio. It's a very close and very honest replica recreation of the famous 1918 A2 BAR, which I have here, an original full auto. Now in this video, we're gonna start off by taking a look at the original and look at the historical context of it, its development. And then we're going to take a look at the development of the recreation 1918 A3 from Ohio Ordnance. Then we're gonna bring them both in and do a point-by-point -point external comparison to see how close they got to the original design. Then we're going to break them both apart and look at the functional differences between the two when we're considering the original open bolt machine gun versus the closed bolt semi-automatic recreation. Again, really excited to dive into this video for you guys, so if that sounds interesting to you, please stick around. It's coming up now. Okay, jumping into this video first, let's familiarize ourselves with the BAR. This is a 1918 A2 variation manufactured by New England Small Arms in 1943. This particular one likely saw service in the Second World War as well as the war in Korea and the war in Vietnam, after which these were largely phased out of U.S. military service. Now the BAR is an open bolt, shoulder fired, gas operated, detachable magazine fed, 30 caliber automatic rifle which was intended to serve in the support role. Now, development with this would begin in 1917, back in which April of that year, the United States would declare war on Germany, thus bringing the U.S. into the First World War. Now, the United States had been observing the First World War as it had been raging on for a few years prior to U.S. involvement, and it was obvious that this was going to be a trench warfare style of engagement in which the machine gun is king. Now, the U.S. Ordnance Department at the time was heavily lacking in machine guns, mostly having holdovers from the Spanish-American War, like the 1895 Potato Digger machine guns, as well as Maxim derivatives, Brené Mercis, Shoshat machine guns from France, but numbers were lacking and the technology really wasn't there. So the Ordnance Department set out to modernize this area of its armaments, of which it was pretty coincidental because John Moses Browning had been working on a couple designs of his own. The first being this variation, the BAR, the Browning Automatic Rifle, and the second being what would later be adopted as a 1917 water-cooled machine gun. John Browning had approached the United States Ordnance Department requesting an audience for the demonstration of his machine gun, which he received of about a group of two to 300 people who were awestruck by the sheer firepower, the reliability, the modern nature of these machine guns that he had brought to the table, of which one of the uh, biggest stars of that demonstration was in fact the BAR rifle. In 1917, it would be adopted and the United States Ordnance Department would press forward full steam ahead to quickly get as many of these produced as possible. They had intended for about four to 500,000 units to be produced, but really by the end of the First World War, just a little over 100,000 had been produced by Winchester, Colt, and Marlon Rockwell. Now, when the First World War, when this really design was uh, implemented for that, it was much lighter and a little bit more simplified than what you see here as the A2. It was really intended to be used in walking fire, in which case you have two opposing trench lines. Oftentimes you would have infantry moving between both lines as they would assault one another, usually cut down by machine gun fire. The BAR was meant to advance with an attacking squad, laying down a higher than normal volume of fire, hoping to keep the opposing lines heads down so they could advance on the trenches. Once they were in the trenches, they could switch it over to fully automatic fire, hose their lines, take over the positions, and everything would be great. Uh, wonderful concept in theory, but horrible in practice, which usually uh, led to disaster. And these really did not make a huge bit of difference in terms of its military application in the First World War. Now, in the interwar period, of course, the United States, like everybody else, is looking to modernize its military equipment. They did like the BAR and the technology, but they wanted to use it in more of a support role, something that was going to be used in more of a advancing maneuvering squad, where this could lay down volumes of fire. We're moving away from this idea of trench warfare into more, uh, I guess you would say, scatter targets. You would have uh, targets of opportunity that would be at different locations. You would have different vantage points. This would have to be more mobile. You wouldn't necessarily know where your fire is going to be coming from. Um, so it had to be more adaptive for those situations. They wanted to put it on a bipod. They wanted to change the sights, the stocks, the ergonomics. So some of the things that they did starting up at the front is they changed the muzzle device. And what you'll see up at, here at the front, 
portion of this is actually a bearing for a bipod, and I'll show you the bipod and everything when we get more into the comparison. And this is sort of your flash hider here at the front. They would add a protective hood over the front, which is actually held on by a ring that goes around the barrel and then is sort of tensioned down by this being threaded over it to keep it in place. The handguard was changed. The original one was actually way better. It was longer and actually came up taller, protecting the shooter's hands from the heat of the barrel. Uh, we d recently did a range day footage. A lot of people were shooting this. You can go look at that footage as I'm actually not gonna have any shooting in this video. If you wanna see this being fired, go look at my most recent upload. Uh, you could see some people had even mentioned that the barrel was very hot and it was easy to accidentally get your hand on and burn your hand, which some people had experienced. So this did lighten the weight, I guess, and was easier to produce, but actually not as ergonomic and not as beneficial as the original um, 1918 variation of the handguard. Uh, they did add a heat shield in this as well. Coming up here to the receiver, they did add these guide wings to the front of the trigger group assembly so you could quickly guide in your magazine a little bit better. Not wholly necessary in my opinion, adding a little bit of com uh, complexity to the manufacturer and the weight of the firearm. They did change the sights. Um, the original 1918 uh, BAR sights were better in my opinion. Uh, you did have this ladder scaling sight that would come up here. This was really more of a peep aperture and a front post. Great target sight, but a really bad battle sight in my opinion. Now, early in its adoption of the 1918A2, it did use the walnut stock similar to what was used on the standard issue 1918, but by about 1943, due to material uh, getting difficult to come by, of course, a lot of use of walnut and other firearms, they would go to this sort of Bakelite resin stock. So this is what you would see after about 19, late 1942, early 1943, was the implementation of this stock. I prefer this stock, and you'll see that I've put one on the one that I have or the 1918 A3 uh, SLR from Ohio Ordnance. I just, to me, this is more of the World War II look, even though the walnut would be correct for this era. But by about 1938, this would be selected as the new standard support weapon for the Second World War, again, going on through Korea and then into Vietnam, usually serving with the Arvin, of course, the M60 and fully automatic variations of the M4, or I should say support weapons support variants of the M14 had been implemented in Vietnam. But these would be used as ancillary firearms for the Arvin and support forces and things like that. One other final note is Belgium, FN in Belgium had come up with a derivative of the BAR as well. Now in early testing, the Belgian variation had a pistol grip and a variable rate of fire selector. Now on the A2, they did decide to go with a variable rate of fire selector, but they went with a Springfield design, not going with the FN design, which they had originally intended to do, which would have a pistol grip, which is actually far more ergonomic. The reason they didn't want to do that is because they wanted to have the ability to retrofit all of the existing 1918 BARs into A2 configuration, which they did. Uh, by and large, for the most part, so it's actually not too easy to come by an original 1918 variation today that's been unmodified. Now, the when the A2 configuration would kick off, they would bring in New England Small Arms as a manufacturer, which this is, as well as IBM, International Business Machine. They made M1 carbines as well, known for making computers, um, as well as Royal Typewriter. So you would also still see Colts and Marlin Rockwells and things like that as these would be retrofitted, but those would be your three new manufacturers coming in in the Second World War. So now that that is sort of the history and the gist of this, let's go ahead and take a look at the 1918 A3 SLR from Ohio Ordnance. Okay, so here I have the Ohio Ordnance 1918 A3 SLR, which is a semi-automatic copy of the 1918 A2 BAR you guys just saw. And I've got to tell you, the similarities are uncanny. This is a very, very, very good facsimile, very good representation of the original BAR, knowing that I have two of them right here to show you. And I'll go through the very detailed comparisons here in a minute. On this channel, I've done a lot of comparisons with original machine guns and other semi-automatic re uh, recreations, replicas, if you will. And I've got to say that this is by far the closest. There are a couple things that you can immediately look at to know that you're looking at a semi-automatic variant, and I'll explain those in a minute. But if you're not aware of those things and you saw these sitting next to each other, you would really have no idea which was the original and which was the replica unless, you know, we're looking at wear patterns or, you know, if you really brought this through, you know, several years of fighting and, you know, you sort of get the wear patterns on this like the original one has. Other than that, you really can't tell the difference. Now on this, what I've done is I have taken original, I have spare furniture kits, 
uh, from a 1918 uh, A2 BAR and I actually put them on this rifle. So this does not come with this sort of original type furniture. This is the original Walnut handguard that it comes with, which is a brand new manufactured part from them. Very clean, beautiful looking, but I just really like the worn out sort of look of the original. Plus I'm a purist, so I like you know having as many original parts on this as possible. Also, this is the original stock that uh, would have come with the firearm. You could get it in either the Walnut configuration, which remember, keep in mind, that would be very early World War II, or you could get it in the Bakelite variation like this, which would be correct for a late World War II variant. This, I had an original and had it installed. Now, I will say one thing. When I did get the rifle, I intended, I, I really wanted this on it. I had a spare set, which was no big deal. I asked that this one be sent with the rifle, just would have been installed, you know, as I would want it. It showed up with the walnut, not a big deal. I figured I'll take the walnut stock off. I've taken the stock off of my original before. It's no big deal. They really, really, really tightened down the retaining sleeve in here that keeps the stock on. I was unable to get it off. In fact, I even damaged the rifle trying to get it off. I sent it back to Ohio, Ohio Ordnance. They were very, very, very good to work with. I thought the customer service was great. I didn't tell them you know, anything about this being reviewed or anything like that. So I expect that that level of customer service would be normal. They replaced the damaged parts. Um, and you know, they said that, you know, and of course we didn't send it with a stock that you requested. So we're gonna take care of that. You know, I tried to replace it myself. I was unable to. Also Scott from Machine Gun Dad tried to get on the phone with me and help, me, help walk me through it. But they locked these into a special vise and torqued these things down with a bit on a socket wrench um, that I just, without the exact tools, this was just impossible to get off. So it might be a little difficult to work on something like this if you don't have the appropriate tooling. Um, if you don't intend to like take the stock off or anything like that, then don't worry about it. But I will say as a company, they are great to work with. And I did want to, you know, be fair with them on that, that they were, you know, took that, they, they took care of everything, got this back to me within a week or two. So I did really appreciate that. Um, Getting back into the firearm, uh, this is not an original magazine. Uh, this is an original magazine, of course I just stuck in here. Very, very close, and we'll take a look at these in more detail, but this is a reproduction that they manufacture. Now these were introduced by Ohio Ordnance in 1996. They're still being produced today. I know like in 2019 they did discontinue them briefly, but they just came out with another batch of these. They are not cheap right now. They're retailing at about $5,500, so if you want one, it's not going to be inexpensive to purchase, but I am telling you that they are really, really good close representations. So if you are a huge fan of the BAR like I am, and you don't have an FFL or an SOT, like my 1918A2 is a, uh, a uh, pre-DR sample, uh, real transferable BARs that most people can purchase are going to run you thirty to forty thousand dollars right now. So of course I know they are more fun in full auto, but to get something that is a really close representation, and you can even shoot it in semi-automatic and it would be fun. Um, for $5,000 for the level of detail in this, I know it's a lot of money, but it's not considering every part in these now is new manufactured. So that's just my opinion. Again, looking at them and handling them side by side, I, I there's just functionally no difference. If I close my eyes and you hand it one to me or the other, I would have no idea which one I was holding without feeling the selector switch or something like that. So I can't go on enough about just how awesome uh, this is. In fact, when I originally purchased it, I had intended to just purchase it so I could do this video and then I was going to sell it as inventory in my store and like after five minutes I decided I was going to keep it just because it's really cool. Um, functionally, it is, um, if we look at the parts, the standardization of the parts, they do fit all uh, parts from the original 1918 A2 BAR other than, of course, you're not going to get the original fire control group, the original bolt, the original trigger group in here. The receiver's been designed to limit that from happening so that these cannot be readily converted to a fully automatic, which is required by the ATF when you're making a replica like this. It does fire from the closed bolt, which it has to. It is not an open bolt like the original. So again, other than the functionality, of course, uh, you, you can't do that. But if you wanted to put an original barrel, original sight, this is actually an original bearing and muzzle brake that I put on this. Uh, this is not what came with it. If you wanted to put an original gas tube and gas system on here, you could. Of course, it takes original magazines. It takes original furniture sets. So you can modify this 100% to be with original parts other than the receiver and the internals, which is cool. In fact, that's how they used to manufacture these back when these were introduced in the 1990s. Uh, so, uh, you know, they were built on 100% surplus parts. Those, if you find those on the used market now, are very expensive because they're using original surplus parts. But Numeric and all sorts of places like that sell 
uh, original part. So even if you wanted to get one of these, uh, and I think they used to, but I don't know if they still do would sell just the receiver, uh, you could build these on original parts and get an authentic BAR, again, less than the receiver and the fact that it's not select fire. But very cool nonetheless. I know a lot of people are gonna say it's too big and impractical for a semi-auto, but there are a lot of collectors out there who would want something like this for their collection. And this honestly is a really good alternative. So with all of that praising out of the way, let's go ahead and show you what I'm talking about and look at a point by point exterior comparison of the two. Okay, let's go ahead and take a look at the back end. As I already mentioned, I had replaced, or I had they, they had replaced for me, the original, um, uh, the one that it had come with, uh, with an original Bakelite stock. Now, I just like the way that this looks on the firearm, makes it look more like an authentic 1918-82, and, and these sorts of things, looks are sort of everything, because that's sort of what you're buying. Um, so I like that look, but if we look in the comparison of the replica that they make, and this of course is not original, they make this in-house, or at least it's made, manufactured for them as brand new and assembled on these guns, it is very close to what you're gonna see. It just looks brand new. So you just don't have any of the wear patterns or anything on here. Now the butt plate was taken off of this and put here. This is the replica butt plate and it works in identically the same fashion. Now there were two variations of the butt plate. There was one that attached with one screw and one that attached with two. This is an earlier two screw butt plate. This one that they manufacture for their firearms is a later one screw. So you would have a screw down here and then you would have a pin that would sort of drive into the top. So you kind of hook it into that, that groove with a pin and then you drive that screw. This has a screw here and a screw here. It's functionally the only difference between the two. Again, stocks interchange, butt plates interchange, no matter on what sort of system you have. Although, if you do have a stock like um, this one, yeah, this even has the screw hole. So you can use a screw or you can use the pin variation. It doesn't matter. So that's pretty cool. Let's go ahead and take a look at the receivers. First of all, the charging handles, exactly the same. In fact, you could take a replica, or I'm sorry, you could take a new manufactured charging handle and plug it in here and it's gonna work just fine. Mainly a lot of parts changeability. This appears to be a milled rear sight base. This original one is stamped. This is one of the first things I noticed is sort of catching my eye is not looking completely right for the build, uh, which is this, but of course they're manufacturing them new in-house today. If you want to, you can get an original rear sight assembly, which they're not very expensive, and you can replace it here if you, of course, want to give it the original sort of look. But other than that, functionally, they serve the same purpose. They have a ladder graduating site that pops up if you want to use, and I know you're not seeing that there, sorry. That pops up there. Same here on this one. Now, one of the biggest dead giveaways on the semi-auto versus the full auto is of course going to be the fire selector. Now on the original one here, you have a slow fire mode and a fast fire mode. So that's slow, that's fast. You have a little pin here you pop down and that gets you into safe. The original 1918 BAR had the same fire modes except the forward position was semi, the back position was full, and then all the way back under this little detent pin was safe. Now the reason you do that is because as you're advancing across no, man land, no man's land, you likely have it in semi-automatic. Then when you get to the trench, you're gonna go to fully automatic. You don't wanna override that selector and end up on safe. So that sits up there to block the travel of the selector where you physically have to push it down and slide it over it to get the gun on safe. Now, if you're starting on safe and entering an engagement, you wanna to go to fire. You do not have to depress the pin you just push off and then go to your selector modes. But again, if you wanna go back to safe, you have to physically push that down with one finger, bring yourself on safe. This has two fire modes, safe and fire. So this is of course not fully automatic. So, and you do not have that detent pin pre preventing you from going to safe without manipulating it. You can just push it between safe and fire. So that's one functional difference. Another thing you're gonna notice on this side of the receiver is that to take apart the trigger group housing, the fire assembly, there is only one retaining pin here. The semi-automatic version has two. Not entirely sure why there are two, uh, but there are two. So this is the original one that would be there. They've added this one here to the back. So when we get to disassembly, I'll show you that difference as well. Now here, the trigger, because this is an open bolt machine gun, you're gonna notice a difference in the contour of the trigger. There's somewhat of like a trigger bar extruding here. The trigger pull is gonna feel a little bit different. You don't have that here. Magazine release on both is the same, and you have the protecting ears, or I, I'm sorry, the guide ears for the magazine guides. Uh, on either side here as well, which look very close to the original. Now I know we're upside down now, but here's the opposite side of the receiver. Again, virtually identical. You can see your bolt is sort of like a 
toggle link, if you will. Uh, it does have a joint that locks up here into the locking shoulder on top of the receiver. Now this part, you can see, is actually removable, so you can remove and access your locking shoulder if you need to make any type of repairs or replace the part to make the lock up better. Uh, anything like that. Both the original and the Ohio Ordnance work and variations have that functionality as well. Your receiver marking serial number and everything like that is right here on the top of the receiver, which is exactly where they put their markings as well. This one, of course, is in New England small arms with serial number. This is Ohio Ordnance Works with the model and serial uh, number designations up here as well. Okay, the front of the barrel and the forehand alignment is identical. In fact, as mentioned, this is the original beautiful looking walnut handguard that would have been installed on this rifle. Now, I put an original handguard set on, again, just to make it look more aged and original. But the contours, the cuts, the size, the screw holes, everything is exactly to scale. It's exactly identical, totally interchangeable. So if you want that new clean look on it, you can leave that on there. If you want to pick one of these up, and again, handguards are like 20 bucks. They're not very expensive. You can pick up one of these. The screws are reused. You can use the original screws that it comes with. You don't need to get new ones. Pop right in the gun and you're good to go. The heat shield, there are slots right here for the heat shield to slide into. You can kind of maybe see that. Uh, those slots, of course, are very, I mean, they're the same cuts on an original. So you can use the replica heat shield in there as well. The sling swivel on both is the same. You can loosen it and slide this anywhere along the gas tube. Gas tube is identical and of course interchangeable. I can take any part off of this and throw it down here except for the internals. So we'll keep moving that back. Those gas regulators are the same. They function the exact same way. All the way up here to the front end. This is a um, original bearing and uh, muzzle device, flash hider. So is this. The bearing area is the same, but you'll notice the one here on this side is slightly longer. This area is where the bipod is gonna sit. I'll show you that in a minute. This is the original one that came on the firearm, which again, the bearing surface is identical, but the length is a longer variant, similar to this one. And of course, they're interchangeable. The thread pattern on both is exactly the same. This is an original protective ear. If I can pull that off of there. The one that they make is identical, but a replica. And they're totally interchangeable. I can put the original onto here and it'll tighten on just fine. I can put the replica on this one and it would tighten down just fine. So again, everything interchangeable, which I personally think is really cool. Now, if we take a look at the bipod, this is the original bipod. I'll show you the replica in a minute. It works by, you have a set of wing nuts that loosen and then you can tighten it to deploy the bipod and you have a separate set of wing nuts that work to uh, retract and extend the legs to give yourself elevation. This is actually a really bad design, not easy to deploy. You typically would have this pre-deployed and walk around with the legs deployed because uh, you're not gonna have time to mess with getting these things deployed when you're getting shot at. Oftentimes, a lot of guys would just take these off as they added a lot of weight and they wouldn't use them all together, which is why you typically see them, you know, pictures and things with them removed off of here. In order to install it, you just slide this into the bearing area of the muzzle brake, and then you would just thread it like this. It's actually easier to do with the legs a little bit out of the way. Thread it like this. I already took care of that off camera, but thread it like that back onto the front, and you're gonna see it can pivot all the way around the gun and then deploy it. Now, when we get into disassembly, which I'll do here in a second, actually having this on the bipod with the bipod legs deployed makes this a lot easier to work on as it just supports the front end of the firearm. Now here I have the bipods of each installed on both. This is the original, this is the Ohio Ordnance. The guns are sort of turned on their back. So this is the top of the gas system on each, which will be helpful in disassembly in a minute. As you can see, the stylizing on both is a little different. You have these cut recesses into the top of the original, which you're not going to find on this. This is more of a rounded surface. This is more square cut, but functionally they work the same. In fact, this one actually, the lockup and everything feels tighter and more rigid. It just, it could be because this is used and worn and this is brand new. 
But if I had to take one of these two bipods, I'd probably go with this one for, you know, you know, practical applications for shooting at the range and stuff. It just feels more rigid. Again, that could just be because this is worn, this is new. Functionally, I mean, it looks the part and it serves the same purpose and functionally it is the same. You have a locking wing that's here to, to retract the bipod back. Um, and then these to extend your elevation. Okay, first let's go ahead and get into the disassembly of these and then we'll get into the functional technicalities of each so you can see how they differ. I'm going to start by quickly removing these slings and I'll be right back with you. Okay, first thing we're going to do is remove the trigger groups on both and this is the full auto here at the top. Now there is a pin that pivots down. I kind of use a screwdriver to help sort of convince it to move. That'll turn down, allow it to remove and be set aside. And I got to remember not to mix these parts. From there, this trigger group assembly can be removed and that's all there is to it. Um, here's the bottom of the firearm there. And you can see it just functions off the principles of a sear where you're holding the bolt open. It's an open bolt firearm. And when you push on the trigger, all you're doing is you're moving the sear out of the way and the spring will cause the bolt to drive forward and fire the firearm. It's gonna be a little bit different on these semi-automatic configurations. So when we get into disassembly of that, it's going to be exactly the same. We have these pins here, which will rotate. I might be able to do this without a screwdriver. No, I'm not gonna be able to. And I'll lightly use this to pop it out of the way. There it goes. Turn and remove. Now remember, we don't just have one, we have two. So we have a second one back here. That one just moved fine. That's out of the way. And then this trigger group, can pop right out. You're gonna notice right away that this one here has a hammer. This is the sear. Other than that, functionally, they're very similar in look and feel and weight. Um, but when this one fires, we're dropping a hammer, which is going to hit the back of the firing pin extension. And we'll show you that when we get closer to the bolt. So there's your first functional difference between the two. Continuing on from there, we're going to remove the handguard assembly and the gas tube assembly as well. Now again, on this side, there is a single pin that works somewhat the same way, where you turn it down here and then drive that out. Same thing's gonna be here, but we'll go ahead and move this. Now here, we'll begin to move that off of the firearm. You will have to retract the bolt and everything to give it clearance to move right off. And there it goes, and that is our operating rod or gas piston rod an extension i'll move this out of the way here on this one it's going to be the same thing we're going to turn this over now keep in mind when you get one of these it's going to leave a nice semi-circle line and i have not even done it yet on this kind of trying to get it to move without scratching any of the finish with a screwdriver pop that out of its notch. That turns, leaves that beautiful mark for us, and then that pops out the exact same way. This will come off in an identical fashion, so we'll start to bring this forward, bring this back. I think they make a pen to help you hold this open. that goes slid that off the same way you're going to notice the same parts right in there your gas piston rod which is virtually identical to the original now how's here's the original guard hand guard and gas tube assembly gas regulator at the end here is the ohio ordinance this is a heat shield this should have one but doesn't i need to get one that just keeps the hand guard from getting really hot but it's identical otherwise. And again, all the parts are interchangeable. From there, I'm going to remove the drive spring, which pushes kind of forward and we'll have to spin it around, letting it come through back the receiver here. And that's up and out. That's the drive spring and rod, which are two separate pieces. Again, the Ohio ordinance piece. We will remove the exact same way. Everything in here is generally just tighter. There's that, same spring, same rod, and we will set those aside. 
Now I have to remove the charging handle from the carrier, which is also attached to, I guess you would call this the gas piston extension. There is a hole on this side of the receiver. I want, there is a pin that's holding all those parts together. I need to align it with this hole in the receiver, which I have done. And then I can, I think I've done. There's a corresponding hole on the opposite side of the charging handle, I can push from that side and drive that pin out here, which will allow the charging handle to come off the side of the firearm. That will effectively detach the, uh, the op rod extension from the bolt. I can reach in here and pull A little actuator that actually bumps to the back of the firing pin. I can pull that out, kind of act somewhat as a hammer. And that's as far as we'll get there. Now I can do the same on this side by, it's difficult here, aligning those components again with the charging handle, which is there. And we can do the same thing and drive it out pulling the charging handle off of this. Now the next thing is, is there is sort of a locking wedge on this side of the receiver, and it is spring loaded, and the field manual says to basically pry that leaf spring off and then you can pull it out. I usually just push it out of the way with my finger and then slide the bolt up over it. It sort of retains the bolt down in place. And with the pressure sort of removed from it, you can slide the bolt just over it, back and out, and you can see sort of the toggle link action of that bolt. Um, with the bolt out, then the, um, the gas piston rod and extension can come right out too, and then that is fully field stripped. Now I moved the full auto out of the way in order to do this one, but again, instead of actually prying out that leaf spring and pulling out that, that sort of locking wedge, sort of just pop it out of the way with the screwdriver on my fingers and get down there and pull up over it and out. And there's that bolt, and then again, the, let's see. Okay, there is a wedge in the back of the operating rod and um, extension, which pops out, and then that will allow this to come out just like on the full auto version as well. Okay, now let's talk about how the two are functionally different, and it really boils down to the heart of the assemblies which are here. Here's the op rod or gas rod with the op rod extension. Here is the link pin, which holds sort of the hammer, is what I guess we'll call it, or the hammer face, the striker face, if you will. It's just a, it's a solid face that the firing pin bumps up against. The bolt and uh, carrier assembly, I guess you would call it. And it really just toggles like this inside the firearm as it's actuating. Now it toggles upwards, and when it's in the locked position, this is going to be recessed into the top of the receiver, that sort of bulged out area at the top of the receiver we pointed to, which is the locking shoulder. So when it's fully in battery and firing, now keep in mind, this is an open bolt machine gun. So when it's retracted to the rear, it's sitting like this in this configuration. We pull the trigger releasing the sear, which causes this entire assembly to drive forward. As it does, this is going to lift up as it cams upward against these camming surfaces. It'll lock fully into the locking shoulder on the top of the receiver, and the striker is going to then strike into the front of this sort of striker face, I guess we'll call it. When it returns, there is a camming surface inside here, a corresponding groove on the firing pin here, which cams on that surface, causing it to retract back. When it hits that striker surface here, move this out of the way, it causes it to retract forward into the bolt. I'll try and show you guys this closer with the firing pin installed. So you see the firing pin right here? When it's in full lock up here, this will drive into the, to the face of this, causing the firing pin to protrude outside the bolt face. When it goes back, this straightens out. A camming surface engages with the firing pin, causing it to retract, so it's not there anymore. When it flies forward again, this will cam up against these surfaces causing it to lock into the locking shoulder, then watch right here, the firing pin, which is here, will slam into this surface here, causing it to protrude forward and fire. So you get this motion, cam firing pin away from the bolt face, up, lock, allowing the firing pin access to the back of this surface, which causes it 
to fire. And of course, this isn't inside a receiver keeping everything linear. So it's kind of hard to replicate by hand. That'll break up, back, and fire. And that's the motion that it goes through when it's an insert and when it's, in, uh, when it's firing. Now, if we look at the semi-automatic version, it's going to function in much the same way, but there's one added part. And that's this, which rotates. As you can see that back and forth, move out of the way. See how that part rotates here and here? Back and forth as the gun reciprocates. Now this fires from the closed bolt. So when we're locked, you'll notice that that's going to lock up into the locking shoulder, just like the fully automatic one does. And this is pointing backwards. This is a spring-loaded firing pin extension. Now that this is toggled up, the firing pin is on the back of the bolt here, which it is on the full auto as well. But this is an extension. You'll see that driving through and smacking the back of this. When this is in the, when this is straight, the link pin's releasing it now. When this is straight, therefore not in battery, this is protruded up. No longer can access the back of the firing pin. When it goes up and locks ready to fire, it's now in line with the back of the firing pin ready to fire. Now, technically, we would be in battery, closed bolt, round and chamber, ready to fire with the firing pin extension able to make contact with the back of the firing pin. What's going to ignite it? Well, that's the difference we saw on the trigger. This is a hammer on the trigger group housing, not a sear. So when you pull the trigger, that's gonna drive forward, hitting the back of this, pushing it into the back of the firing pin, firing the gun. It's gonna cycle by unlocking, traveling backwards, coming into the chamber, locking again, giving access to the back of the firing pin extension here. And that's gonna be sitting just like that. Hammer will come, hit this, strike this, hit the back of the firing pin, come into the front of the bolt face, strike the primer, igniting the round. All right, guys, well, that is all the time I have for you today on these. Thank you so much for stopping by and checking out this video. If you enjoyed, please let me know by hitting that like button. Please also consider subscribing to my channel. Hit that bell notification button so you are aware when I am posting new content. Anyway, guys, I'm going to leave you off there. I am Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports in Westfield, Indiana. You are watching Marksman TV, and I will see you next time.